Good evening and welcome. I'm Diane Meyerhoff, host for tonight's candidate forum for state representative in Chittenden County District 42 in Hinesburg. Tonight's show is being aired live on Channel 17 and streamed live on the Channel 17 website. We welcome your comments and questions. Please join the conversation at 862-3966. Candidates joining me tonight are the incumbent Bill Lippert, a Democrat, and challenger Sarah Toscano, a Republican. Thank you both for coming out tonight. Thank you. Good to be here. The ground rules for tonight's forum are that the candidates will make opening statements of up to two minutes, and they will answer prepared questions also for two minutes with a possible one-minute rebuttal. We're going to start with opening statements about why the candidates are running and what their priorities are for the two-year term, and we're going to start with Bill. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm pleased to be here um, and running again for election in Heinsburg, which is really the district that we're looking to represent. We're fortunate that it's one town, uh, all except for one tiny little corner of Heinsburg. I'm looking forward to representing the folks of Heinsburg and working for the people of Vermont uh, one more time. My background, which I bring to this race, is uh, my work as a director of a mental health clinic. I worked in um, Heinsburg as a Justice of the Peace. I've lived there for 40 years. And so I'm looking forward to uh, bringing my leadership skills uh, to the next two years in the State House. I feel fortunate to have been appointed by four different speakers to leadership positions and currently chair the House Health Care Committee. I'm looking forward to continuing my work in building safe and healthy communities as well as working for civil rights for all Vermonters, as well as continuing to do the work which happens on a regular basis, nonpartisan response to Heinsburg voters and citizens. I've worked for highway traffic safety. I've worked to support suicide prevention. I've worked to strengthen the mental health system. I've worked to end drunken driving on our roads to save lives to prevent and end domestic and sexual violence. And I believe that these issues are important to the well-being, the safe and healthy communities that we deserve in Vermont. And in the last session, I did support and proudly support the gun safety legislation, which has uh, become an issue and a an issue of difference between me and my opponent. Uh, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk more about that. I look forward to serving Vermont again and serving the people of Pinesburg. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, tell us why you're running. Um, I'm Sarah Toscano. I'm running, um, I'm opposing the incumbent, Mr. Lippert. Um, earlier in the year, during the debate on this proposed gun safety law, um, I was unable to get a return call from Mr. Lippert. I know he was busy, but made four, four phone calls during the debate period and I received no response. In addition, we left fur further messages with the Sergeant of Arms, both myself and my husband. We were unable to get any kind of response, including to an email at the time. So we found um, that at the time that the representative was not really representing a segment of the population. So I figured, you know, I would do my best to fill the gap. So um, I am. I was able to meet Mr. Lippert on primary day. We talked for a long time. In fact, we talked for five hours, yeah. and um, you know we got to know each other pretty well. But the I think that in some areas we are definitely going to differ to the point where you know it's going. You know we we want what is best for Heinsburg, but we may or may not agree on which path to take. That's the only thing. That's all I have to say. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we're going to have, we have a series of prepared questions. Um, and I'd like to start off uh, talking about health care. Um, how do we limit health care spending uh, in Vermont while also remaining one of the healthiest states in the nation? And um, Sarah, you can start us off. Um, well, the I think that's going to be the quickest way to limit health care spending is to bring, um, is to balance out the currently aging population with a 
um, you know, younger families with children, bringing them into into Vermont because of the fact that, um, pardon me, the uh, elder folks are do are generating more health costs, so the younger are contributing to the health care pool, you know, and not, um, and, and the expenses are balanced, will, will balance out. But um, in addition, there is also that we need to pay full cost of expenses to providers for patients on Medicaid, catamount programs, which will also end the cost shift, which is a major factor in driving up the cost of private insurance. And we need to loosen some regulations that have driven out private insurers. This will make the pool a lot easier to um, to manage and not have the cost of healthcare go up every single year. Okay, um, Bill, tell us how do we uh, contain healthcare costs? Well, Vermont is one of the healthiest states in the nation. We're fortunate in that. We're also uh, rated. We're the second. We have the second lowest rate of uninsured Verm Vermonters, lowest rate of uninsured people in the state. Uh, and that's because Vermont has made a commitment to health care reform and health care, uh, to reducing health care costs. Uh, one, of the, one of the areas that's completely outrageous is the increases in prescription, the cost of prescription drugs. In the last session, uh, our health care committee uh, took several actions to try to uh, address this by increasing the transparency, requiring the prescription drug companies to actually justify the costs of the increases, some of them which are outrageous, some of them increased by 500 uh, percent. In addition, we passed a bill which was the first in the country which will allow us with the state of Utah to approach the federal government to look at importing prescription drugs from Canada safe prescription drugs and we because Utah is a traditionally red state we're a blue state uh, we're approaching the federal government jointly to try to take President Trump up on his campaign promise of reducing the cost of prescription drugs we are also uh, working very hard at shifting Vermont to a health care system where there is not an incentive to uh, bill for every procedure that takes place. We're moving from fee-for-service to a quality of care me mechanism. And that, we believe, will actually reduce the cost, will, it will bend the curve. Let's be realistic. I think we're not going to reduce the cost specifically, but we should bend the curve on health care costs. Uh, this, in addition, this last, this past session, I'm very pleased to say that we added uh, free ultrasound for breast cancer uh, diagnosis. Following, every Vermonter is eligible for free breast cancer mammography and screening, but in the past, if you had any kind of unclear diagnosis uh, and it was recommended that you have ultrasound, you were going to have to pay for that yourself. As of this year, every Vermonter should be able to get a diagnosis a mammography screening for free and this is going to reduce the cost because the cost of actually the kind of interventions the costly chemotherapy and other interventions uh, will allow us to offset the cost of the of paying for the ultrasound as well as the mammograms okay I'm so, going to stop you there sure um, and Sarah if you'd like another minute you can have it I don't think I need it on okay. the topic all right Thanks. we'll move on let's talk about the economy uh, according to Forbes magazine um, Vermont's economic outlook is projected to be the second worst in the U.S. over the next five years, at the same time while income growth is expected to lag behind. Do you agree with this assessment? Uh, it is somewhat controversial. Um, what is your plan of action uh, to strengthen Vermont's economic outlook, promote income growth, and generate a sustainable economy? And Bill, you're up first. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm not sure I do. I haven't seen the report, so it's hard to say the specifics. But I would just suggest that Many Vermonters are struggling, and there's no question about that. But there's also an issue of, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? And frankly, I think there has been too much emphasis on the difficulties uh, that Vermont creates, barriers that we present, 
uh, in developing our economy. I think that uh, we should be willing to claim the successes that we have and to invest more in both job training as well as, I believe, one of the critical investments we can make to help Vermonters and the economy is to invest in higher education. I have the honor of having been elected by my peers to the uh, trust Board of Trustees of the Vermont State Colleges System, which actually educates more Vermonters than all the other colleges in Vermont together, and in fact provides first time for family members going to college. It's estimated that if we, we have more students graduating from high school than almost any other state in the country, but we have the low, one of the lower rates of students going on to further higher education. This is how we build our economy, by giving Vermonters the chance to gain skills, both technical skills as well as uh, professional skills, by being part of the opportunity to go to college, uh, to go to a further technical school, and that is going to actually build our economy, but which requires an investment on the part of us as the legislature and the governor to make that happen. Okay, Sarah, we're talking about the economy. Um, I actually do agree with the report. I read through it pretty extensively. Um, and um, an Ethan Allen report I've read in addition showed that good paying jobs leaving or reducing their presence in the state f from 2013 to 2014 and continuously since then. It said that um, the, the new, uh, in addition, the job openings that were created are not of the same caliber. They are service industry, they are cashiers, they are wait staff, they are housekeepers and hotels, you know, things that are not, you know, going to feed families and pay mortgages and, and things like that. And in addition, most, um, we, we are currently the most costly state in the country from, to manufacture anything, so that's driving manufacturing jobs out. I'm sorry, it's my fire pager. It won't stop. I keep, I turned it off, still won't stop. Um, and we are at 95 point, not, uh, sorry, 95 cents point nine to manufacture one dollar worth of goods. Um, the, at this, the nationwide average is 83.3. And that has to do with expenses, regulations, therefore um, expenses incurred in order to comply with regulations, taxes, everything else of that nature just adds up too much to create these good paying jobs. So um, we need to start pulling some of this back in order to strengthen Vermont's economic outlook because every, you know, families are relocating. Currently this last session, the legislature saw fit to pay people $10,000 to move to this state to work from home. That is not the kind of solution we, that's going to get very far. <laughs> we need to have the jobs here that draw the, the, draw the families here. Um, cause, because currently by 2030, even if Vermonters are willing to devote 18% of their adjusted gross income, two thirds of tax dollars collected will be needed to pay for public education. And all the remainder will be required to fund human service programs. And that doesn't require, doesn't count all the other expenses that the state needs to run. And the solution is going to have to be some serious discipline. And that's what I'm here for. Okay, thank you. Um, let's switch gears yet again. We have a, a broad topic uh, arrangement here today. <laughs> Lots to talk about. Um, let's talk about water quality. Um, how do we increase funding to clean up Vermont's lakes and rivers? We certainly heard a lot here about, about Lake Champlain and algae blooms this summer and, and, and such. Uh, so Sarah, you'll start us off. Okay. Um, increasing funding to clean up the lakes and rivers is going to be the, what we need to not do is to put all of the burden on farmers. That's where things are going. Because um, the agricultural industry is suffering at the moment and we just can't continue to pile on more regulations that they can't get past and um, so you know there's a few solutions like what we need to make some one-time expenditures to improve infrastructure so that the sewage is no longer being 
backed out into the lake. Um, we, and I have a few other solutions that I've come up with, including tying ex some existing farm grants to completion of uh, land stewardship training, especially with new farmers. And actually, I've asked a few, and they said that wasn't a terrible idea. So the, um, in addition, we should, instead of d going straight back to taxpayers in our state, is there are a whole host of places we can go from the federal government in addition to some um, competitive funding that, you know, from USDA, Federal Highway Administration, Fish and Wildlife, and, and a list of what we call competitive federal funding to pay for water quality improvements, it, just depending on, it mostly has to do with what is being approved. Okay, thank you. Bill, we're talking about water quality, how to improve uh, water quality in lakes and rivers in Vermont. Well, there's no question that uh, Lake Champlain and our rivers are part of what's important in our economy. It's part of what brings tourism to Vermont. And I think we have to be willing to step up and recognize that over time, we must be willing to raise some funds to address the issues of water quality. I think that uh, the, the, the issue is uh, the numbers I don't have right in front of me at the moment, but it, it's going to require some many millions of dollars to uh, restore Lake Champlain. And I actually uh, share with uh, Sarah some of the concern that farmers should not be uh, targeted. Uh, in fact, I think it's my understanding that uh, much of what we need to do, because there's a lot of work that farmers have done already. Uh, in terms of meeting uh, the agricultural standards that have been set by the state, setting uh, buffer zones along, uh, along the waterways on their farms, et cetera. But we also need to recognize that it's the, the federal government. We are under a directive from the federal government to come up with a solution. And uh, if we do not find a solution of our own, the federal government will step in and direct us to do things. And they are going to direct us to put more money into our municipal sewage plants, which has been determined to, as I understand it, only account for about 4% of the uh, pollution into Lake Champlain and other waterways. So we need to bite the bullet. Uh, the legislature has pro made several different proposals, uh, whether it should be a per parcel cost that is uh, built into the land exchange process when land is purchased or some other mechanism, we're it's going to cost money. And uh, I think there's agreement that uh, the treasurer's office uh, that we needed to put some money aside for this year, we've done that, but there needs to be a longer term commitment. And uh, I'm sorry, but it's not going to just come out of the air. It's going to cost Vermonters some funds to preserve what is a treasure for Vermont, what, which in fact, if we allow Lake Champlain or other rivers and, and streams to be degraded as they are with algae blooms, et cetera, it's gonna cost us in the long run in terms of our tourist economy. And so this is an investment. This is an investment that we need to make. Okay, thank you. Sir, do you wanna put, have someone take the pager? Would that be helpful for you? Do you mind? I'll do. <laughs> Keeps Great, on. thank you. Um, so you both mentioned uh, agriculture uh, in this last question about water quality. Uh, and what about the dairy farms, right? We have very few dairy farms left. Um, is this an important issue for the state? Uh, what, what should be done? And uh, Bill, you'll start us off. Well, dairy farming has been an essential part of Vermont's, uh, both our agricultural, uh, clearly our agricultural uh, success uh, but farmers are, dairy farmers are struggling. We need to support, and one of the key issues is that we need to support movement from dairying to uh, other types of uh, farming that allows for a broad range of um, uses of that land. Keeping the land productive is absolutely essential. Uh, Sarah and I were both just recently, uh, we both attended a uh, Know, we'd call it a workshop or it, yeah. was, a, it was a meeting yeah, of, of local farmers from the area but it was farmers who are looking at other ways to um, to use the land in a more diversified mm -hmm. manner the future of dairy is controlled in large part the costs 
or the reimbursement for dairy is controlled largely at the federal level. So we're not going to be able to intervene in that as directly as we might like in Vermont. But when we, what, what we can do is to continue to support dairy farmers uh, as they make transition to um, diversified farming. Uh, right down the road from where I live, uh, there were the farm used to be a dairy farm, now it's a, a pick your own berry farm and uh, it's just changed hands because it was able to change hands because of the work that the state has done with the Vermont Land Trust and others to allow younger farmers to come into farming without having the opportunity of inheriting it. And so supporting our land trust, supporting diversified farming while advocating for dairy farming as well and not imposing new uh, on, on burdensome requirements uh, is part of what we can do to support dairying and to support agriculture generally moving into the future. It's a key part of Vermont. It maintains our landscape again, which is part of what is keeping open land in Vermont is a key issue for the state of Vermont. Okay, so talking about agriculture, dairy farming, and other kinds of farming. Sarah. Um, well, the uh, dairy industry in Vermont supports 4,000 direct jobs and 12,000 indirect jobs, both inside and outside the state. Um, it creates 162 million in wages and 127 million in, tax, in state tax revenue. This is not something we can really afford to lose. And most other um, crops do not have that type of margin, even when the dairy industry is suffering at the moment. Um, and Anson Tebbets has said that it's the longest downturn for quite a while. Um, and I regret to see that, but um, I think we need to support anybody who chooses to be a, be a dairy farm. And in addition to help them diversify just so they can get through these downturn periods. And um, in addition, I learned a lot of things during that workshop, which was quite useful, that um, quite interesting in fact that I think that you know whereas I am for fiscal responsibility and you know cutting where one can I do think that we need to continue to make farms available through VCLT and um, that we need to help them every chance we can the to succeed not just to barely hold on you know the dairy farms are Part of you know, part of the uh, infrastructure here. They're also just part of our identity. I can't imagine s telling somebody, "Oh yes, let's change you over to something completely different." And you know, the farms that are failing, the ones that have less than 200 cows, those are the p these are the people who care so much about their cattle they cry when they when they lose them. So we can't be doing that to people. These people are you know, treat their, uh, their livestock as family. They treat, they, they, their family no raises their animals. You know, this is, this is a, a part of Vermont we cannot lose. Can I, yes, can I just add yeah. that I, I mean, I think we share a, a commitment to farming and agriculture in Vermont. And in Hinesburg, we have the family cow farm, which is uh, making raw milk available. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I helped fight for was to have rational regulations around the sale of raw milk. Uh, and we needed to encourage the state to allow the sale of raw milk, uh, which has a market, and that allows them to stay at, keep that land in farming. Uh, we also need to support agritourism, which allows Vermonters to share their uh, experience of living and working on a farm with people from out of state who come here there's actually the people people will pay to come <laughs> and visit farms in Vermont mm -hmm. which is a good thing uh, and so I think there's creative ways that uh, that we we've, we've engaged in we need to do more and um, and I think we will try to do that absolutely I, in addition I think we do need to loosen some of the um, the regulations that um, are simply burdensome and may possibly Red, um, possibly just check, you know, have have people's phosphorus monitored, and have you know, if it's at a certain level, let them be the stewards of their land, not necessarily 
be so super picky that they can't afford to keep up with their new regulations. Okay. Thank you both. Obviously an issue that is close to both of your hearts, so I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to chat about it. Um, let's talk a little bit about opportunity. A recent uh, VPR PBS poll found a solid majority of Vermonters support paid family leave and raising the minimum wage. Um, both, house, both passed by both the House and Senate um, and vetoed by the governor this past session. Um, they are likely to come back up again. How um, did you or would you vote in the future? And Sarah, you're starting us off. Mm -hmm. This is where we will differ. <laughs> so the, the plan that I've read says 0.136% of income would fund it. Um, my husband's base pay of 90000 which would mean he would be paying $122 a year. 70% of his wages for 12 weeks um, becomes $10,500. So I don't really understand exactly how this program could possibly stay solvent for very long at all. They're talking about only needing to have contributed for one year, the year before, which would make him have con having contributed less than a tenth of what he'd be taking out. Um, so I don't think I could, I could vote for it as it sits because the implication is that the taxpayers are going to be ma made to make up the difference, you know, without having consented to doing so. No, I, and you were talking about uh, paid family leave, right? Okay. Did you also want to address minimum wage? Oh, absolutely. I thought we were doing one separate, but my fault. Um, well, it's a nice thought, but it also does not work out so well. Um, Fifteen dollars an hour does not give everyone a raise. Instead, it devalues skilled labor to the point where everyone is then working for minimum wage. Um, raising minimum wage also brings out, brings people out from under the poverty line, which is where they are granted assistance. So um, it does not mean they're going to be able to afford to pay their rent or feed their children or afford daycare, but then they're, they're made ineligible for subsidy. So essentially if they want to work, they cannot work if they are um, under the line, if, if they were already under the line. Okay, Bill, we're talking about paid family leave and raising the minimum wage. Well, I voted for both. I voted for paid leave, family leave, and I voted for the minimum wage, both of which were vetoed by Governor Scott. I do want to also, because we're coming short on time, I think, here, to acknowledge that uh, Governor Scott also did vote for, did pay, <laughs> did sign the gun safety legislation, which I think we also uh, have different points of view on and mm -hmm. haven't had a chance really to talk about here yet today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in addition to voting for minimum wage and paid family leave, I voted for the, what I believe are the common sense gun safety laws that Governor Scott signed and that the board of the Champlain Valley S Union School District uh, supported as well. And I, I think our constituents, our voters, uh, should be allowed to understand where we differ on that issue in addition to some of the issues we talked about today. So, Okay. Sarah, do you want another minute? Um, on that? Um, sure. I'm a Second Amendment organizer. I organized um, 36 candidates in the state to run against people who voted for the <laughs> gun uh, safety laws, um, the, there is absolutely no reason that any of these laws make anybody more safe because the only people who obey laws also do not break them. So <laughs> we are um, at a stalemate in that department. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I completely am uh, pro-Second Amendment and pro Article 16, which is actually considering considerably um, more lax than the Second Amendment. They um, spell, spell it out that, you know, we, that a law-abiding citizen is t able to own guns, period. Okay. Well, 
we are out of time, but thank you both. I know it went quick. I apologize. Uh, thank you both so much for coming out tonight. We appreciate it. Um, and don't forget, everyone out there, you can vote now at your town or city hall or on Election Day, which is Tuesday, November 6th. Um, and, of course, stay tuned to Channel 17 for more Election Day coverage. Thanks so much and good night.